So today, today's the topic of today's podcast is the evolution of language. Uh, it's still a mystery. We don't know exactly what happened during human brain evolution, maybe even you know pre-humans, uh, uh, that led to our this fluency of ability. This to language pervades our lives, and we don't even think about it every day. But it's a very complex process, and. So today we're going to learn from Professor Eric Jarvis at Rockefeller University, who's actually been studying, he's been interested in how language evolved for a long time. And he decided to focus not on humans, but on songbirds, which can learn, obviously, sequences of sounds and, and fluently reproduce them. And of course, in the birds, you can interrogate their brain in a way you can in humans. And there's some, he's been working on actually genetics and trying to understand um, genes involved in the language circuits and and kind of from a comparative uh, biology, neurobiology standpoint, get at kind of the, uh, actually the molecular basis of language evolution. So Eric, um, you're at Rockefeller University in New York. It's kind of an interesting place. It's uh, in a way, unlike a lot of other universities, it's completely focused on research. Do you want to kind of give a background? I know you got your PhD there and you've been there a long time. You went to Duke then came back. So talk about Rockefeller. People may not know much about it. Yeah, well, well, just a little bit of history there. Yeah, I went actually went to Hunter College nearby as an undergraduate in biology and math major, and then went to Rockefeller for graduate school. Uh, when uh, did my PhD in the lab of Fernando Nadevam, uh, and uh, you know studying songbird uh, vocal learning, stayed on as a postdoc in the same lab, then went to Duke University and came back seven and yeah as assistant professor. Uh, eventually got full professor and came back uh, 17 years later uh, as a full professor at Rockefeller. And that was back in 2017 when I came back. And yes, it's uh, um, a special place in that um, the students uh, have a full funding from an endowment for first five years they're there. So the students aren't really bound to any particular lab for funding. Uh, so they have more freedom to explore labs as well as explore projects. Um, and these, Eric, these are graduate students. Not that's right, graduate students. students. Yes, yes. Yeah. And the university does not have an undergraduate uh, major or program, although we do have undergraduates come visit our labs and do summer research or local ones do, uh, you know, year round research for those that, you know, uh, labs that have the means. Uh, and uh, the university prides itself on two factors. One is training leadership in science, and the other is um, allowing uh, people to take uh, do high risk projects and think outside the box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, talk about songbirds now. Of course, language we think of spoken and written language, and the presumption is, and I think there is evidence for this, that spoken language of evolved first before there was, I mean, as far as we know, we're the only species that does written language. So, you know, it's obviously important to study vocal language. Now, talk about songbirds. What, What is their language? We think of words. Yeah. What? Yeah, so um, uh, our ability of spoken language, language, that is, depends upon multiple traits. And some of them are kind of ubiquitous across the animal kingdom, like the ability to learn new information about sounds you hear, like you can teach a dog to understand the word sit. Um, but uh, there's another uh, component to spoken language that's pretty rare. Uh, and it allows us and parrots and some other species to say the word sit right. and imitate it or whole sentences and so forth. And so we call this vocal production learning. And so songbirds have it, we humans, parrots have it, um, and dolphins and whales and uh, elephants and huh. hummingbirds. So it's about eight or so groups, a few bird groups and a few mammalian groups that have it. What about, you didn't mention crows. I had Nikki Clayton on talking about, 
you know, her work on the corvids and the food catching and their kind of intelligence and ability to use tools. And I've seen videos where they're, they're repeating words that people have said. Do they count as, as vocal learners? Yeah, yes, actually, crows are songbirds. Many people don't realize that. Oh. Yeah, they, they, they use the learned vocalizations not much in the form of singing, as many other songbirds do, but producing learned calls. And yes, uh, like some other species, they can learn how to imitate some human speech sounds. So they're, they're a songbird at the base of the songbird family tree. Uh, okay, and then they're, these animals, like humans, right, they, when they're very young, they, they learn their language. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, so so I kind of distinguish between what people might call language and song and speech. Okay. Um, so uh, all of the, these species, including us humans, uh, use learned vocalizations for singing, uh, including mate attraction uh, and uh, territorial defense. Uh, only a few species have then gone on to use learned vocalizations to uh, to uh, communicate more abstract semantic information. Of course, us humans, uh, and we would call that language, right? Or spoken language to be more specific. Uh, and that abstraction can include everything from what we're doing now, which is, you know, communicating ideas about what we do to names like dolphins have these whistles that indicate names of from one individual to another. Oh, wow. Um, some uh, chickadees, a songbird, will have different calls that mean different sizes of predators and perhaps even different kinds of predators. Uh, so yeah, uh, dolphins, humans, and parrots, I would say are the most proven vocal learners that use it for more semantic communication, but you know, all of them do sing. Okay, so these sequence of sound, sound waves come into our ear, right? Mm -hmm. And And somehow, well, there's couple, somehow there has to be a, when we learn, it comes in and then something goes on in the brain and then they're able to activate whatever the muscles that control right. their vocal system. That's right. Right. So, so we know, what we know of so far is that the brain area is processing the sequence of sounds, which is a little bit in humans, it's right below the ears and other species a little further back in the brain that that brain region or brain circuit for processing sequences of sounds is present in all vertebrates, all right? And this is why we think they all have auditory learning. But only the vocal learners then have this extra brain circuit uh, in which those sequences of sounds are transmitted to. Uh, and this extra brain circuit we call the, the song system in songbirds or the speech circuit in humans are is involved in translating those sequences of sounds into the ability to to control muscles like the larynx mm -hmm. and the jaw, the tongue, to actually imitate the production of those sounds. And and where does the memory come in? You know, so that yeah, you know, when you're learning. So so the memory of of the actual auditory processing of those sounds and and the motor production of those sounds. Uh, where it's stored is not quite exactly clear, mm -hmm. but one thing it is clear, it's that it's part of those two circuits that I discussed. So it's not like an extra set of brain regions that is storing the memory for learning how to produce the sounds. Oh. It's that the same brain circuit for producing the sounds is where the memory is stored. And whether it's in one or two of the brain structures, all, all seven, for example, in songbirds, uh, it's still unclear at this point in time. Okay, so in humans, you know, so do you want to talk just briefly about Broca's area and yep, Wernicke? Yep. Yeah. yeah, so so in humans, uh, the names of these brain regions for storing the auditory memory of the sounds heard uh, would be uh, primary auditory cortex and Wernicke's area, okay, uh, which is right next to the auditory cortex. And the brain circuits for learning how to produce the sounds and actually producing them would include Broca's area, as well as, uh, which is more interior in the, in the frontal lobes, as well as something more in the midline area here called laryngeal motor cortex. Okay. Um, 
where I don't mean midline in the brain, I mean a middle between posterior and anterior regions. Yeah. So laryngeal motor cortex controlling the larynx. Uh, the larynx is where a lot of the action occurs uh, for modulating sounds that then, you know, I can change the pitch, I can change the fundamental frequency and so forth uh, to uh, control vocal learning. And we, we use our tongues too for speech, right? Yes, yes. So we use our tongues, and the, and the, the tongue is important for modulating uh, and 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 controlling uh, the different sounds. Uh, but it turns out it's not as important as the larynx. The larynx is the most important in terms of modulating sounds for learned vocalizations. I I don't I don't want to people yeah. walk away that the tongue is doing nothing. But what's interesting is that um, other species, including non-human primates, some other species. They have better voluntary control of the tongue and the lips. Uh, and there's, you know, orangutan that can actually learn to produce whistles with the lips. Uh, not, not as good as humans, but decently. Uh, but can't get a word out modulating the larynx. Huh. Uh, yeah. so, so there's something special that happens with uh, laryngeal control, voluntary control. Now, you you know, I've, in preparing for this podcast, I went back and looked, obviously, at some of your publications, and I went through, there was a special issue of Science, the Science mm -hmm. Journal magazine, uh, on, on language. And so I'm going to put it in the description section of this podcast, links to, to your review article on vocal learning and the songbirds, and then some of the other ones I thought were interesting. Um, so... But in looking at all this, you know, so right now on my other screen, I'm looking at one of your uh, illustrations of comparing the songbird brain to the human brain and kind of the, uh, I guess you'd say homologous mm -hmm. uh, regions. You know, you've got what the motor regions in red and the, the sound information. Anyway, but one thing's missing from there. I studied the hippocampus most of my career. Okay, <laughs> and 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 my understanding was that for a lot of learning and memory, like the hippocamp, the information from our sensory systems, whether it's visual or auditory, kind of funnels into the hippocampus, and then like the initial um, coding, short-term memory, it kind of mm -hmm. happens there, and then somehow long-term memories might be stored elsewhere is there any role for the hippocampus in in vocal learning in the songbird yeah yeah by the way writing writing that article is one of my favorite articles to write because i i really had you know allowed myself to have freedom to really explore uh you know our and update what we know about relationships between songbird and humans uh, for song and speech uh for the hippocampus I do get this question every once in a while of like other d brain regions besides what we would call the four brain circuits, like the um, cortex, basal ganglia, thalamus, and so forth. So it's the hippocampus, the cerebellum is another one people ask me about. Mm. And so far, um, I think these brain circuits outside of the ones that you see in that picture there in that article, um, they could have involvement in uh, speech, uh, you know, vocal learning, um, but in a in a more broad aspect of circuits that go through these other regions for many different behaviors. Uh, uh, so, so hmm. um, but I don't think they're specialized. The, in other words, lots of species have hippocampus. All vertebrate species have actually hippocampus and right. cerebellum, right. Uh, but they don't uh, produce learned uh, vocalizations or spoken language. That's, yeah, that's yeah. true. So, so what's going on there in terms of thinking about hippocampus broad function uh, nality is, yeah, when I was a graduate student, um, the, I remember uh, an argument that the hippocampus is where long-term memories are being stored. I even tried to, you know, work on a project involving the hippocampus, both birds and, and rodents, you know, um, with another student at the time uh, to see, you know, uh, could they help store memories during sleeping, you know, and there were some interesting 
patterns of activation in the hippocampus during sleep after an animal experienced some events during the day. Um, but I think the overall field of neuroscience has moved to the idea that not all memories are going through the hippocampus or, and yeah. you know, that it's a, it's a storage center for the entire brain. Uh, so so, so, what I, so I'm, at, I'm at home now and I'm looking out the window. We have a bunch of woods behind us with a trail. Mm -hmm. And from evolutionary perspective, I'm thinking, okay, so I go on a trek in the woods, say whatever, I'm hunting for food or something or foraging even. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, uh, my brain remembers where I've been and I can kind of visualize it. And then I go back to my, say, tribe, mm -hmm. tribe mates, fellow tribesmen or women. And, um, and I say, and then I verbally tell them, you know, so I'm using language, you know, tell them, well, you know, I went down here by this stream and then, you know, whatever, up on this hill, there was a bunch of these berries or something. So somehow there has to be an integration of, and I know you were, you're involved in performing arts and dance. There has to be some, it, and, and I guess the point there is, the hippocampus is very important for spatial learning. Yes. So somehow, you know, what's encoded there has to be transferred or 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 interdigitated with the language aspect. You know, converting my experience to language. Mm -hmm. um, so, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So I I think that's you know. Uh, let's say more supported by the data that yeah hi hippocampus is heavily involved in spatial learning right uh you know there are other parts of the hippocampus may be doing something else for emotional learning or something like that but i think spatial is pretty convincing and uh uh you know and that that of course would mean that it has to have decent connections with you know the visual mm -hmm. system uh you know perhaps you know uh, auditory systems as well you know if you learning about sounds during space in space but for speech uh i i haven't seen convincing evidence that um that it's you know doing something specific for speech huh. uh, okay all right yeah <laughs> um sorry about that and, and, and so from a from a method you know experimental technique standpoint one way to determine which brain regions that are involved in you know which behaviors is in animals is to actually lesion or damage mm -hmm. you know specifically a brain region and i assume that's part of what's been done in the you know vocal learning studies is that right mm -hmm. that's right yes yeah yeah and, and and so in humans kind of the way that um say broca's and wernicke's area wernicke's area were discovered is by kind of accidents you know mm -hmm. natural lesions where someone gets a brain injury um okay so anyway if you if you damage the hippocampus doesn't have any effect on songbirds vocal learning right that's right yes okay yeah I, i'm not going to say i I'll, I'll have to clarify and double check the literature if there's somebody i want to say maybe there might have been one study that finds some sm small change in pitch or something like that uh, but but in principle, no. The, uh, the, the, to our ears, the song sounds similar. Okay. Okay. So year. I'm gonna I'm gonna quit talking about hippocampus. And it's okay. I, I guess I was trying to. I was like, I want there to be some role. Right. <laughs> the hippocampus. Okay. So now you have a lot of, of big studies going on where you're looking at gene expression. Um, so you know, there was a time when, I, I don't know what the exact time was, maybe 10 years or more, where the sequence of all the genes in, say, mouse and even humans was established. But in some of these other species that are less studied, and, and maybe in some ways harder to study, I don't know, from genetic standpoint, mm -hmm. hadn't been. But now... The, the songbird, at least from some of the species, the genomes have been sequences, 
sequence. So you can actually look as as birds learn songs or or as they perform vocalizations or whatever uh, gene expression and kind of see what genes are changing. So this is a, it looks like what, from what I gather, one of your major efforts now to understand, mm -hmm. kind of get to the molecular basis of, mm -hmm. of uh, vocal learning. You know which brain regions are involved and kind of how they're connected, integrating the auditory input with the uh, motor control of the, the vocal organs, larynx, and so on. And now you're trying to get down to what genes and the what proteins they encode are involved. So mm -hmm. could you spend some time talking about that? Because it, it looks like it's a major effort from what I can Yes, get. that's right. So, so um, actually, it was about 20 years ago when the human, a little over 20, and then a little after that, the mouse genomes were done, their first 20, yeah. major drafts. Uh, and the, it's about 10 years ago uh, that uh, we published a set of papers on a bunch of bird genomes, uh, including some vocal learning species and a special issue of science. And uh, last year, I was part of a study that completed the human genome for the very first time uh, from end to end for every chromosome without mm -hmm. missing a base, hopefully. And so, so so I, yeah, I've, over the years, um, I was involved in a, a transcriptome study in the mouse at the time the mouse genome was done, but I've now gotten more heavily involved in genomics uh, because I need it for my research yeah. and it's helpful for the scientific community as well. Uh, but I kept my neuroscience you know, hat on. I'm still doing primarily my neuroscience work. So the latest consortium that I'm involved in is one that I'm actually helping to lead called the Vertebrate Genomes Project, whose mission it is to produce high quality reference genomes of all 70,000 vertebrate species, uh, which is a tall order, you know, that's <laughs> kind of, you know, taking- Are you, are, are you gonna know the names of all those species? You won't even know no, but the I'm, names of species. But I'm getting to know names of a lot of species, but I don't think I'll remember all 70,000. <laughs> But, and even a bigger project afoot, you know, that uh, involves overlapping leadership with the Vertebrate Genomes Project is the Earth Biogenome Project to eventually one day have all 1.8 million species genomes of eukaryotes. And so, so yeah, so the, oh but we're doing these in phases and the first phase of the Vertebrate Genomes Project is focused on all vertebrate orders, including all vocal learning groups and their close relatives. And, um, Go ahead. Do you have a question there before? It... Yeah. So I'm I'm thinking of you know the evolutionary tree, right? The yep. phylogenetic tree, the classic thing you, you see. And so, so now you you know say in the future you're gonna have all the living species. Yep. And maybe some extinct species because right people because are getting, they might be extinct by the time we finish them. Well, yeah. That's yeah. that's a not good. I. You know, I've noticed this with insects in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, when I grew up in the summer or spring and summer, we'd go on a drive and we'd get all sorts of insects hitting our windshield. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I, I don't see it anymore. That's a good point. Yeah. And, and actually, that's pretty well established. We're using losing a lot of insect species. You know, birds eat insects. Mm -hmm. Right. A lot of birds. Right. That's right. Yeah, you know, birds are going to be, you know, this. But anyway, the evolutionary tree. So if you have, like, and this is just massive data, right? This massive data analysis. Right. But you could have an evolutionary tree looking at the evolution of genes. Mm hmm Wow. That's right. But, evolution of genes, evolution of species, um, evolution of, you know, traits that even go beyond vocal learning, because you'll have, you can have a trait database for all these different species. Uh, you know, those that fly, those that don't, those that, you know, have theory of mind, maybe those that don't, who knows, you know, but. <laughs> and, and so in the songbirds, you know, there's different species and you're, you're, you're looking at, again, I guess you're mainly what I've seen, you're kind of, which 
very logical initial step is to compare birds that may be kind of closely related, but some of, but one species has vocal learning, yeah, and the other doesn't. Right, so, right, exactly. So with these genomes, uh, and you know, students in my lab like Andres Fenning and Gregory Jedman, who have now graduated, um, we've utilized these genomes to measure the expression of hundreds, thousands of genes in the brains of vocal learning species, their closest relatives, including humans versus non-human primates. Hmm. And what we found is that there are several hundred genes uh, spread out across the different parts of the vocal learning circuit, like Broca's area, laryngeal motor cortex, uh, HVC, and RA in songbirds, that have up or down regulation of uh, different genes uh, only in the vocal learning circuits compared to the rest of the brain or the surrounding brain subdivisions. And um, these genes have a uh, tend to have three principal functions to them, you know, either one of three, uh, involved in brain development and neural connections, uh, which makes sense because vocal learning circuits have some differences in neural connectivity compared to the surrounding brain circuits, or they are involved in neuroplasticity, which makes sense because um, you need a great amount of, of, of flexibility in these brain circuits to uh, pr produce these imitated sounds and learn how to uh, modulate the oral musculature to do that. And third is uh, a set of genes involved in neural protection, uh, protecting neurons from overtoxicity of calcium, of glutamate. And the reason why I think that's the case is the larynx in humans or mammals and the syrinx in birds are the fastest firing muscles in the body. And you need very fast firing oh, neurons yeah. uh, in the forebrain or wherever the circuit is controlling the vocal behavior uh, to uh, control these fast firing muscles. And so, plus we use these muscles a lot. We yeah. talk a lot, right? Birds sing a lot, uh, the songbirds at least. And so, um, <clears throat> so what I think is going on is that these molecules like parvovimin, heat shock proteins and others uh, are there to uh, protect these neurons from dying off from controlling rapidly firing muscles. Now, okay, so these, do you, what, it might be good now to kind of step back to uh, Fernando Nonobaum's work with uh, showing that some of the neurons involved in the in song actually die every year and then are yes. replaced? Yes. And so you mentioned one class of, of genes you're seeing are genes involved in promoting the survival, neuroprotective genes. Are they down-regulated uh, kind of in a purposeful way when neurons die? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, and Fernando Nadevon, my former PhD advisor, who's still at Rockefeller, he's retired, but he's still there. I, I have lunch with him every several months. And so, uh, and and try to get the history of uh, these uh, discoveries from him because he he, he was, um, you know, one of the major discoverers of the song system and neurogenesis and so forth. So um, <clears throat> yeah, there's thought to be an apoptotic uh, program for uh, program cell death in these vocal learning circuits, particularly, yeah. but it's in the in the brain in general that the some species go through a seasonal cycle of change. Like birds molt their feathers, while well, they molt some of their neurons. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, and what happens is that they stop singing. Uh, you know, at a period of time a year where the the neurons are dying off and new ones are going to come in. And when new ones start to come in, it's at a time of the year where they're picking up new songs. So it's thought that these new neurons are, are both acquiring the old songs that were there. Uh, so it's not like they totally forget what was done before and acquire new songs uh, right before the spring breeding season. And so, uh, which, which and, then... But do exactly the same number of neurons 
die as are replaced or are, are there do they end up with more neurons than they have it doesn't, it doesn't seem like they they end up with as far as i can remember you know more neurons okay you know is that i mean i wouldn't say their brains are not getting bigger but the 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 amount of new neurons is is not a big net gain over what they had before nice. yeah that's that's just a fascinating process it's kind of a recapitulation of developmental mechanisms yeah that's, that's occurring every year that that's right that's right yeah. now what we don't know um but i and your your question is making me think we we should do this experiment what we don't know is those several hundred genes that i say were convergently regulated with humans in these brain circuits do their specializations recycle every year in other words during this moat like non singing period, yeah. does the specialized expression go away and yeah. then return again? Yeah. Uh, during uh, you know the renewal of these neurons. Okay, recruit another graduate student. Yes, okay. this this I, we got to do an experiment on and find out this because I don't. We certainly didn't do it, and I don't think anybody else has either. I would have okay. known because. Uh, um, okay, good. That was worthwhile doing this podcast. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, so th since I retired from the NIH uh, three years ago, I've written two books. One I had to write was on intermittent, the science of intermittent fasting, because we've done all this work going back to the 90s, and then this got like really popular, but there wasn't anything on the science. But the second book, it's titled Sculptor and Destroyer, Tales of Glutamate, the Brain's Most Important Neurotransmitter. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I didn't put anything on songbirds in there. <laughs> if, if I would have done this podcast before, I would have. But anyway, that's coming out this summer. But it gets, and this is something I picked up on, you know. So let's talk about a few specific genes. There's this gene, and, and some many of these genes you're finding that are associated with vocal learning, these three main cats, they're transcription factors. Mm -hmm. They're genes that encode proteins that control other genes. That's right. And one of them, which somehow I, I don't know what the homo, what the equivalent gene is in mammals, but it's calcium regulatory factor. Mm -hmm. C A R F. Right. Right. Is this I know about Kreb, right? Mm -hmm. Which is kind of the classic calcium one of them activated transcription factor. Right. So what is C-A-R-F, calcium? So, so that's one we haven't studied a whole lot, but uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, I think this one is one of those that would be involved in, um, you know, uh, calcium signaling as well as perhaps, you know, sequestering calcium uh, that's, uh, you know, releasing these rapidly firing neurons. So you mentioned parvalbum, and now we're, you and I are getting into a lot of the nitty gritty science. Yes. But, but there's this protein that it it's in neurons, uh, these, and it's in neurons that are highly active, like these ones you're talking That's about. Right. And it binds calcium. So when, That's a, right. when a neuron fires, mm -hmm. calcium rushes in, and that's good. It, it's important. It's a signal. It activates transcription factors and does other things. But if calcium levels go too high in a neuron for too long, it can actually kill the neuron. Right. And so it's important to buffer that calcium. Okay. So does this calcium regulatory factor, this transcription factor, is parvalbium in one of the genes that it regulates? This we don't know if it oh, is. Okay. I, I'll, right. I'll tell you something where we, we are, we found the uh, relationships between transcription factors and, and some other ones that's actually more involved with testosterone um, ah. regulation. But but yes, CAR, CARF is specialized in these vocal learning circuits. It's possible that it's regulating other genes, including involved in calcium yeah. uh, in specialized ways, the downstream targets. Yeah. Um, but what, what we have found recently, uh, some work we're putting together for publication by graduate student uh, Lindsay Can Canton, who was in the lab, was that, um, yeah, for these several hundred genes, we don't think there's several hundred mutations in their regulatory regions. 
we think there's a few upstream transcription factors that have mutations in their regulatory regions, which then causes uh, the remaining uh, genes to be ah. specialized, up or down regulating these vocal learning circuits. And um, uh, one of them is the androgen receptor, mm -hmm. uh, which um, is you know a receptor that binds to hormones and uh, then can regulate. It's at the cell surface, and it can go internally to regulate genes. Uh, another is neuro D six. Uh, uh, it's a, a transcription factor specific in the brain, uh, and we see a lot of these genes. I have to look to, to see about parvovirus and CARP itself, but a lot of the genes that are specialized in the circuit have transcription factor binding sites in promoters or enhancers in front of. No, for for androgen receptor, for yeah. uh, neuro D6, uh, that we think then is causing their specialized regulation. Now, in, in mice, um, you know, the, the classic thing you do is you, you knock out a gene that's one gene, and you can knock it out in all the neurons in the brain, or you can even knock it out in, say, these parv albumin neurons. Um, mm -hmm. Now, is, is that kind of a approach being used or are there's other ways right RNA interference are these are you knocking out specific genes or disabling them and then looking at vocal learning yeah we're, we're knocking out genes uh, to um, study their roles in uh, vocal learning but in a in, for a different kind of way of asking the question okay so it turns out that a lot of there's a number of down-regulated genes in the speech circuits. Uh, and some of these down-regulated genes are involved in repelling connections to form in the brain. So a huh. so slit and robo uh, combination. A slit is a ligand, robo is a receptor. When two neurons, one has a receptor, one has a ligand meet, what happens if there's high levels of the ligand and receptor it prevents that connection from forming. So we call this the you know repulsion hypothesis of neural connectivity. Interesting. Yeah. Well, a bunch of these genes involved in repelling connections from forming are downregulated. Interesting. In the speech area. So what we think is happening is a loss of function is causing a gain, a loss of function of the gene. Yeah. In the speech circuit, it's causing a gain of function itself in the connectivity and the um, uh, behavior itself. So you what know, we're trying to do you know, is Eric, cause the loss of function of the gene in mice. Ah, uh, that, that's intriguing. That's really fascinating. I, you know, in, in autism, so there's kind of a story developing in autism that there's kind of an accelerated uh, uh, growth uh, of you know, axons and dendrites, and maybe even the overproduction of synapses. Mm -hmm. So that there's, now what about uh, developmental speech disorders in humans? And, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of interesting to think that there's some parallel between these gene pathways or maybe even the same dang genes that are altered, you know, during brain development in, in humans that can result in some sort of developmental disorder. Uh, yeah, that that's that's exactly what's going on. So a number of these uh, genes that are specialized and convergently specialized in humans and songbirds are also, when mutated, are associated with autistic deficits, including verbal deficits in autism. Okay. Uh, so, um, so we think there's a relationship there. Uh, and sa same thing for speech language disorders uh, So and, and developmental speech disorders. So uh, Moat-Wilson syndrome is one of them. Uh, FOXP2 gene, when it's mutated, causes a speech uh, learning deficit. Uh, we find that is, you know, has some specializations in these circuits. Uh, Slit and Robo also have been implicated in autism. So um, mm. what I think is going on there is um, it's not like when these genes evolved a role in specializing speech circuits that they lost function in the rest of the brain. 
uh, or gain function. Uh, it's that in the circuits for speech, they became specialized in their regulation. Then other mechanisms came in and tried to prevent that specialization in the rest of the brain. Um, and when they're mutated, uh, some of these other functions that they do in the brain are kind of decently preserved. There's enough redundancy. But since it's more novel, their regulation in the speech circuit, uh, a mutation affects the speech circuit more than it does other circuits in the brain. Ah, and yeah. this is why I think you get speech language disorders or more specific deficits with FOXP2 mutations. Interesting. You mentioned FOXP2, and there's kind of an interesting history on that. I remember, you know, at one point, there's some, I, this is a long time ago, some paper came out, probably in Nature Science, you know, maybe as a graduate student, I, you know, because when we're graduate students or postdocs, every week we look through Nature and Science, right, and maybe some yep. monthly journals once a month. But, and of course, back then, there wasn't, we didn't have any computers. We actually had to go to the library right, and look through these. And we couldn't cut and paste references. We had to type them out. <laughs> uh, anyway, so yeah, some paper came out and it was like, Fox P2 is the language gene. Or I mean, that was kind of the headlines, right? That was the headlines, the press headlines. Yes. Um, and as often happens that, the initial headlines are kind of over, overstate the actual right. result. C could you spend a minute or two like talking? Because I don't really know the details of the history of FOXP2. Yeah, I would say FOXP2 was the first gene where there was a convincing association with a, a speech language deficit, uh, more so than other deficits. And so um, it's a transcription factor. Uh, it like CARF, it regulates other genes, uh, and later on it was discovered it regulates most of the other genes involved in synaptic uh, uh, connections and plasticity. And so, um, uh, yeah, this was a paper that yeah you know, came out in Nature. Um, uh, several groups, uh, one of my close colleagues now, uh, Simon Fisher, made discoveries of, of this gene. And what happens is that. Uh, uh, heterozygous mutation of the gene. Uh, when it's heterozygous mutation, like an inactivating mutation that prevents the gene becoming a normal protein, uh, it causes a speech deficit. If it's homozygous mutation, both alleles are mutated, uh, animals don't survive. Right? Right. But it's not a gene specific to humans. It's found in all vertebrates. It's found in the brain of all vertebrates. Yeah. Uh, but it's somehow become more linked to spoken language in humans than other species. And what, what do I mean by that? This mutation doesn't affect a child's ability to learn how to get auditory memories, understand speech, uh, which is consistent with the auditory circuit being present in all species, right? Uh, but it, ha it's, it affects the ability for uh, children to learn how to sequence phonemes to make more complete words or more complete sentences. Uh, so uh, they're okay at saying simple words, simple sentences, but more complex ones, it's difficult for them to coordinate their musculature to do that and to learn to sequence those sounds. And do they do they have any problems? I know you're you're a, a dancer. Mm -hmm. Do they have any problems in? in sequencing movements, body movements, or is it specific for... Yeah, I, I don't want to say body movements are not affected. It's not like uh, uh, Fox P2 uh, individuals uh, are virtuous piano players, but they can ride a bike. Uh, they can, you know, they can eat their food and so forth. And yeah, so, okay. but I wouldn't say they're, they're the best coordinated individuals, um, but that kind of coordination is affected much less I see. than it is okay. for speech. And, and wasn't there something ab about a specific mutation in FOXP2 that was only in humans or something? Or Yeah, that's right. So there, there are three uh, substitutions in the gene uh, that you only find uh, in humans, or it was initially thought you only find in humans. Several of those were found in bats. Uh, and bats are vocal learners, so 
Uh, there is a correlation there, but we don't find them in songbirds or parrots. Uh, and so, but it, but since these highly conserved regions or amino acids, you know, that uh, was uh, found uh, changed in humans, it was thought that these mutations are necessary uh, for human spoken language. So you can imagine that there have been several groups that have now created transgenic mice with the human version of these amino acids in FOXP2 in, in the mouse genome. And it has been shown that these mice can learn faster, um, uh, different tasks, but they don't imitate sounds. It's, so it's, it's not like these mutations alone uh, is sufficient to cause vocal learning. Um, we, we have gone the other direction where we've taken uh, the human mutation that causes a speech deficit in humans, also put that in the mouse genome, and found that even though mouse vocalizations are mostly innate, they do have different sequences of vocalizations they produce to females during courtship, males produce to females, that is more complex than the ones that they produce when it's not a female around or they're just responding to the smell of female urine. Well, mice with the uh, human mutation that causes speech deficits have difficulty switching to these more complex sequences. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. So, so we think that FOXP2 is already influencing vocal behavior long before vocal learning evolved. Okay. That's, this is really, really great. Great yes. work. Um, so you mentioned bats. Uh, I, this is interesting. Okay. We did these studies with uric acid. That you, you may say, well, what the heck uric acid got to do with what we're talking about? And maybe it has nothing to do with it. But humans have high uric acid levels. Mm -hmm. Bats have high uric acid levels. Birds have high uric acid levels. There was a mutation in a gene called uricase that it gets rid of uric acid. Mm -hmm. The mut mutation occurred during primate evolution. So if you look at you know, like non-human primates that are further away from us, they don't have the mutation, but humans have it. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know, it's just kind of that's, fascinating. Yeah, it's an the same, same animals that have language also have this uricase mutation. But let me, let me double check here because... Um... Is, by the way, I hadn't known about this uh, uh, uric acid mutation correlation, but um, you said birds also have it, but um, is that all birds or specific birds? Because they're the vocal learning birds and the non-vocal learning birds. Uh, it's all birds. We we have chick, we get we have egg-laying chickens who uh -huh. they don't seem to be learning anything when I say something to them. They don't. See, right, that's say right. Okay. So, and they did. Yeah, so it's all birds. It, you can tell by their poop. Okay, so you they, they, they constantly and it enables them. They can live for a long time without much water compared to, say, a mouse. I see. And and this uric acid somehow is, helps them uh, not get rid of as much water in their excretions. But well, anyway, we're, we're diverging. But it, it's kind of an interesting. Correlation. Okay. okay, so let's see. I had another question. It had to do with epigenetics. Yep. And you know, so this has emerged as really fascinating concept, and there's evidence for this that uh, uh, environmental exposures that occur to, say, a pregnant female or a male, you know, reproductive age uh, that lead to some phenotype can be passed on to the next generation. So, for example, in mice, it's been shown if you make a female mouse obese by giving her McDonald's diet, essentially, high fructose, and they're drinking water and mm -hmm. high saturated fat, so they get become obese. If she's under that condition when she's pregnant, the her offspring 
are prone to developing obesity even when they're on a more more healthy diet. Mm -hmm. um, and this has to do with changes in kind of modifications, molecular modifications of the genes that affect their expression. Mm -hmm. Right. And and it, and of course in language we it's it's a little harder to study than obesity. Obesity is like weigh the mouth. But you know, language is passed on. This is like a very important in evolution, right? Transgenerational mm -hmm. passing on of knowledge. Right. Right. That's that's what made us the dominant species on earth. Right. Undoubtedly. So what, what you're working on epigenetics, what's going on there with it in relation to vocal learning? Yes, so we are working on epigenetics. And the one thing we find, you know, just within an individual generation or individual is that um, <clears throat> that the the these genes that are up and down regulated in the song and speech circuits, they have epigenetic differences among them in terms of methylation. Uh, as well as uh, open chromatin areas that we detect using the ATAC seq method, um, okay. where remember those promoters that I the, uh, transcription factor binding sites I mentioned before that are transcription factor binding sites of genes specialized in these circuits. Well, they have epigenetic differences inside the song areas compared to the neurons outside. Uh -huh. Right, so mm -hmm. the genomes of the neurons inside have a different epigenetic signature than the genomes of the neurons outside the vocal learning circuits controlling other behaviors, and we think that they change developmentally. We don't have enough evidence uh, for that for all of them, for a lot of them, but that this is laid down during juvenile development, as during critical periods, uh, that the animals are learning how to imitate uh, songs. Mm. We don't know for vocal learning circuits at least, whether or not these epigenetic signatures get transmitted transgenerationally, uh, like some other people have found, um, like Bianca Jones Marlin at Columbia. You know, she's doing some studies to show that uh, uh, traumatic experiences in your life yeah. can lead to epigenetic changes, not only in your own brain, but in your germ cells, the sperm and egg cells, that then get passed on to the next generation or, or starvation. Some other people have shown that, you know, starvation leads to changes in metabolism in your sperm and egg cells. Yeah. We don't know if this happens for vocal learning brain regions. Uh, that's, we need another graduate student for So you're asking good <laughs> questions for future experiments. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, la lastly, uh, you know, we're getting towards the end, and I know you're extremely busy. Um, what about neuro? You you mentioned glutamate. What what about neurotransmitters? Are all of these neurons use glutamate as their neurotransmitter? Or I assume there's also uh, neurons in these brain regions with the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA. So all, mm -hmm. there's all this vocal learning uh, and and song production involved. Glutamate and GABA circuits. Yeah, yes, it does. So the so you're, there are roughly twenty or so glutamate receptors. A subset of those receptors are also specialized in these uh, brain circuits, hmm. uh, and they some of them change developmentally, like uh, NR2B. Uh, yeah. It's um, hot, like in in the mammalian brain in general. In the vocal learning circuit, it's high during the juvenile developmental phase where animals are actively learning how to imitate songs. Then once it gets to that critical period or the equivalent of puberty in humans, uh, it, then it goes down uh, it, and even further down in the surrounding brain areas, making it harder uh, for these birds to learn and us, I think, to imitate songs or speech later in life. Uh, we, we can, but not as well. And if we overexpress it, in uh, NR2B in the vocal learning circuit in an adult animal, we bring back a juvenile-like character. Oh my uh, God. To a certain degree, yeah. Yeah. Wow, so you can, you know, you mentioned this critical period and we know humans, right? We learn language when we're young and it's like really e e easy. We, 
you know, I can't remember learning language, but right. and and then we get older, it's harder. Like right now, That's if right. I tried to learn Russian, it would be like really uh, a lot of effort, very yeah. difficult. Yeah. So you, you're saying, it, so you can extend the vocal learning period by. Well, we, we, we can try to, we can partially reopen it. I see. You see, by, by um, expressing these genes in the way they were earlier in life. So what about, you know, treating human developmental, uh, this is a, you know, it's a long way from what you're doing to actually doing something in humans. Yeah. Um, Yep. You know, the gene manipulation, that's still kind of a, a dream, you know. That's doing, right. Say, using CRISPR to whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but pharmacologically, you know, manipulating the glutamate receptors can be done. You've done it in the songbirds. Is there any work in humans? Well, well we, we actually did do local gene manipulation in the brain with... Um, uh, Sombers. We actually overexpressed the human NR2B uh, in oh, okay. uh, in what we call the L man song nucleus involved in. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, but as, but but what if you what if you act, this would be a touchy thing, but activate pharmacologically with a glutamate or NMDA receptor. This yeah, is, people have done that and uh, have changed the song as a result as well, or okay. you know, enhanced or impaired. More, more like impaired, you know. Yes. Because they're trying to block, you know, with the receptors with APV, which is a, an agonist uh, for for the receptors. Yeah. yeah. Antagonism. And so, um, by, by the way, to answer your other part of that question, it turns out multiple cell types are have specialized gene regulation in these brain regions. Excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons, uh, and glia. Uh, but the cell type that has convergent expression with humans of those, let's say, three cell types I mentioned, it's the projection neurons that go from one brain region to another that have the most convergent specialization with humans. I see. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, so what about <laughs> written language? Is it? Oh yeah, you did ask about that before. Yeah. So I think written language, yes, is the most recent form of communication to evolve in humans. Um, some let's some will use the terminology written language and spoken language separately, right? Um, however, I and some other people think they're linked. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, and that they're using each other's circuits. What I mean by using each other's circuits. To have written language, you got to see something visually. So that's going to involve the visual system, right? Yeah. But is it going to involve the spoken language system? And I think the answer is yes, because when you write, um, you're using, of course, your hand, you're writing on a piece of paper, uh, but you're also visually seeing what you're writing and you're silently speaking it yes. as you write or as you read as well. And that silent speech is using the speech circuit that the same one that controls the vocal organ for actual production of sounds. So you're trying to perceive and hear what you read by using your spoken language circuit. You know, this makes a lot of sense. There, and there's some people that think that that uh, sort of sign language or uh, you know gestures, mm -hmm. you know, movements to c communicate maybe occurred in evolution in in, in primates bef before spoken and obviously before written language and and this makes sense what you just said because that's visual right that's and right if, and if that actually and it, you know so dogs and we have a cat and yeah you know you can't point to something and the cat knows you're you know, pointing at something, right? Right. But you can imagine the value of during evolution of, of being able to just, you know, without verbal 
spoken language to point to something or, you know, and of course, uh, you know, uh, deaf humans mm -hmm. use sign language, right? Right. So this all makes sense in what you're saying, because if the sequence was gestures or kind of sign language before verbal language, and then written language comes after, you actually had a visual thing going on even before the That's right. Vocal. That's right. Yep. I, yeah. I would agree with all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good, Eric. Um, and I'll, I'll put, you have, I found, a, you know, one, one a couple lectures you've given, you know, formal scientific lectures on the internet. I'll put links to those so people can actually, you know, right See now the they're, they're imagining, they're, they're putting in, they're pu putting into their visual memory encoding or whatever recall. Right what we've been talking about and they can see it and I you know illustrate pictures are often times I agree worth a thousand words in some ways right I'll put that on there um all right sounds great okay I wish you a, a great rest of 2023 and um you know hopefully you know I look forward to seeing in the coming years I'll try to keep up with what you're doing because it's it's really fascinating and fantastic work thanks well, a lot well thank you for your interest all right. Okay. Bye. Bye.